It's so interesting. It's so interesting. It's so, it's so interesting. interesting. It's interesting. It's so interesting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, welcome to It's So Interesting, where people talk about their work and life experience. I am George Spitzer. Today I'm talking with Gordon Rogers, an electronic and optical mathematician, inventor, and hydrologist. Okay, let's get right to it. So I'm going to start first in terms of how did you end up getting into so many disciplines? Is there a common strand? I think modeling the universe as a whole is certainly something that everybody has to do. I mean, everybody has the, a model of the universe in their head, whether they have formalized it or not. You, this is a very broad question. It's just yes. not, uh, this, is a, this next question is going to be very broad to bring out some form of dialogue that we can dig sure. into. Sure. Have we as mankind departed from the universe? Well, some of us think they have, but they, that's their misunderstanding. I don't think we have. You don't have any choice but to be part of it. At least that would be my personal opinion. Sure. Well, <laughs> you are an inventor. Therefore, I would consider you a genius, and I think other people have called you a genius. That's usually a matter of misunderstanding or not understanding what you do, because you know exactly what you're doing. I guess that, that's very kind. I mean, I think genius is local. It's a little tiny facet. I don't think I'm, that it, anybody said it. It's a misunderstood word, but the fact is you do have some better understandings in certain disciplines than most people on the street. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> Perhaps. Modesty can only go so far, Gordon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. You are very active in optical and electronic mathematics, which is demonstrated in a, in a variety of toys that mankind has. Isn't that a nice euphemism? Yes. How did you get into this? Was there a time in your life you said, you know, this is what I want to do? I was basically a biologist. A friend of mine called me organic, pretty down to earth in my personal opinion. At 20, I was working in a neurological department, so I was basically on the road to neurology. I was pre-medical. There was a lot of technology in that. I mean, I was dealing with CAT scans, and I'd already studied mathematics and neurology extensively before I went. And I returned and basically started my dis invention or discovery. I would term it a discovery as much as an invention. When you find an abstract of the universe that's useful or generalizes something that's very complex, it's useful. I mean, that's the kind of the definition of an invention. They look at them as inventions, or some look at them as some creation. But to me, if you've thought about it, you actually discover stuff more than create. Uh, you can create things from those discoveries, and that's someplace why we have technology, and because you can take these models and make stuff out of them. It's just like Newton didn't, didn't invent gravity. He discovered gravity. Right, and found a way to describe it, even more important. I mean, you can discover something and not have a good way to frame the, the identity that you've that you're looking at. You mentioned you were involved in pre-med when you were 20, but was there a time earlier in your life that you said, I want to be a whatever? Like, you know, we all go through our, when we're 10 years old, we want to be a fireman, we want to be a marine biologist, we want to be a doctor. What did you want to be when you were 10 years old? Uh, actually, when I was six, my dad said, this experiment doesn't make sense. And it was Young's double slit experiment, a principal monument to quantum mechanics. And he noted that, gosh, it didn't make intuitive sense from a ballistic kind of throw-the-ball kind of world. It seemed totally distinct from everyday paths of objects. So I would say that that was really the inception of my curiosity. How, why is it that Dad, who knows everything, obviously, could possibly think, gosh, this just doesn't make sense, having looked at it very closely? And so to me, that was probably that one instance was something I would notice. So that gave you a clue that you wanted to discover, invent, and answer everything that you can possibly question. Yes. You take an abstract of nature. All you're doing is constructing a little symbolic model mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. And it can tell you a lot about how things act. Once you get a model that basically reflects the facts, has local predictive capabilities. So sure, you use the math. You, the math helps you. It's a guideline. It helps your perspective uh, and your actions produce better results. Do I think the universe is a mathematical abstract? No. I want to talk a bit about the butterfly effect, and you're part of being the butterfly. Having said that, you're wondering, what am I talking about? You're doing very, very basic research and inventing that can have major consequences for us as a civilization. Am I overstating it? I would like to think so. I've had a very wise professor say basically that. Certainly it's humbling, and that's a responsibility. 
it's a challenge. I mean, it's, it's one of the reasons you push so hard is because it is a big responsibility. You do want to do it. Is it purely altruistic, and can you be the altruistic butterfly? One would hope. You know, you don't know what you're going to get out of it necessarily, and one can only hope that it's going to be of benefit. And there are not that many people around who have an understanding of science and the universe as you do that can be one of the butterflies. I'm, maybe right, not saying, right, it's a, I'm not saying you're the only right, butterfly. Right, it's a herd of butterflies. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but that's what I'm trying to get at, is that you're motivated to do all this and to lead the life of inventing and going where no man has gone before, so to speak. Well, it's definitely interesting. I mean, one of the reasons is it's intellectually stimulating. It's fun. I mean, to, to get to figure it out is breathtaking when you find these realizations of, gosh, that's a model that looks like it holds together. That's an instant. You only get a few of those where you get to go, wow, you know, that aha moment that everybody looks for. That's the fun stuff. I mean, and, to I, me, and I was ready to ask you, I'd like to know about some of your aha moments. Describe your biggest one that you think you've had. What was it? Well, you just took your breath away. You could almost not breathe. Well, the first one that I, where they gave me a patent on it was definitely a, well, go take a cold shower and try and shake that off. It's, it's really pretty intense. I mean, this is not like a, oh, yeah, that was interesting. No, 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 no. It is, you know, gives one chills at that moment. It's like, well, you definitely remember those moments. Well, tell me about it. I had a two-week break between a junior college that I was attending and when I started Berkeley. And the first morning, I guess I didn't have, two weeks doesn't seem like very much time, but when something like that only takes about 10 minutes first thing in the morning over a cup of coffee, and you get like that one little piece that fits together into a much larger model, and you don't even necessarily understand the whole model. You don't get it. The big picture, you, you can't get it. There's no such thing as the big picture. <laughs> it's always a bigger picture if you stay at it. But there are those keys, those instants where you notice some little detail you get that little tiny bit of input that does really provide an aha. There it is, 9 o'clock in the morning, sitting and looking at a large window up in Palo Alto to see a geometry just come together in your head. It was breathtaking, and you don't even necessarily understand. And having a moment to think about it, about what you just got presented, and I was presented the basic element to the optical computers, how they were describing it on the cover of Scientific American. It was a little flag, you know, a little note that sticks out of the magazine. And of course, I, well, the optical computer, that sounds like it might be significant someday. So I thumbed right to it and got in one sentence. And so they, they basically gave me one optical transistor. And I've seen lots of transistors before. So, well, I'm not expecting one to be all that handy, but in aggregate. So you have this accumulation of larger numbers of them and it basically formed a ball. I mean, what other shape are you going to make out of it? Is it going to be some a random shape or, no, no, high density says ball. So you have this big ball of light, right, and, and all radiating in all different, in all directions, but from a common center. And I think that's the single point that I noted was, wow, now that looks like it could happen someday. And, but what are you going to do with that? So it's that moment where you project out of what would that do? What, what could you do with that to find a, and, and basically an envelope to put it in? One of the things that, well, has interested uh, many smart folks over the years, Kepler, when they figured out the rotational shape of the, our solar system, and we've gone much further with it than that now. Even though you can understand a great deal about it, there are lots of insolubles there. So it's not only having the, 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 the quiet little thought, so to speak, that ties it all together, is also once you have the quiet little thought, to know what to do with it, to apply Exactly, it. try and figure out where it would go. And that's where your expertise comes in. Well, your background, if you, if you don't have the background to assess where it might go, yeah. then of course you're lost. So you've got, that's one of the reasons I do think that the studies are worth it. When was this? Oh, that was in 83, February. And what came out of it? Certainly my career, certainly my math degree, a great deal of learning on other subjects. The understanding that it does take a huge organization to put something like that together. It's not just an idea. The idea doesn't do anything. It sits there, a patent is a piece of paper, okay? This is not what we're looking for. We're looking for a, a real manifested things. And as a 23-year-old, I didn't have the breadth, the technical wherewithal to put a huge organization like that together. You don't have a chance. You're, you know, I know 23-year-olds think they're very sophisticated, but they'll probably be smarter at 24, <laughs> or at least know a little bit more. So where has this gone? Has it, has it become a bread box or a concept? Uh, well, I understand. Well, that's an old patent. See, yeah. most patents aren't aren't timely, and so you know, ninety percent of them are 
not worth the paper they're written on. About 10% are worth the paper they're written on, but barely, and about 1% of them are actually worth something financially to the inventor. Right. So, I mean, it's, it's a matter of timing. So I might have been early on that one. I think it's still got real value. I had one of the guys from the IT department came up to me a couple, a couple of days ago and said, well, I think I saw that system you were talking about. And it's, you know, it's a major telecom communi you know, telecommunications company that's put it together. And I think they probably are using it. And they can use it without infringement on the patent. I put it out there. That the result of that was an altruistic act. I gave the world something that's in the public domain that if they ever get to use it, beautiful. So you get to enjoy the aha. Uh -huh. uh -huh. And it, it led to all sorts of other things. Yeah, potentially, life. yeah. And it certainly impacted my life, yeah. Sounds like you've had more than one or two ahas. What was the next one that you could relate to us? Well, the completed history of everything sounds like a kind of an interesting subject. It's like, what will happen to all that stuff? The end of the universe and the beginning, all in the same breath. And having it, finding it perpendicular to the future. That is, where they're independent of each other. You've lost me. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so some of the, the ahas, mm -hmm. I mean, you get to these complicated ahas where you make that relatively complex jump into say, oh, you know, just one minor bold assumption and check it. See, does it mean anything? Just guide me a little bit so I can understand about this most exciting aha uh -huh you've had. Uh, uh, I okay, so this is a complex one, okay? So, that's, that's all. Well, dig um, into it. Okay. Okay, folks, we're going into complex territory. <laughs> <laughs> most people have heard of quantum entanglement. It's a property that is maintained over any space, any distance, any distance, any time period. It doesn't matter if you wait a thousand years to test that particle you can tell how it's going to be when it gets there. And it seems like the information is traveling at faster than the speed of light by a huge amount. Hundreds of thousands of times the speed of light, no problem. Just like that. Sorry, the data's already there. And that seems like a counterintuitive thing. Right? I mean, yeah. you know, say, oh gosh. My, almost, gosh metaphysical. Some, yes. almost metaphysical. Yes. This has to do with space and time and quantum entanglement. While it's not intuitive if you go in and try and hit it with, you know, not that many people are going to get their, tensor, their tensors right. I mean, this is hard, okay? This is mathematically complex. So to summarize it to the lay, to, any, you know, to anybody, to a little kid, and that was one of Einstein's tests. If you can't explain it to a little kid, you don't know, you don't understand it yourself. And so you're going to have these words that seem like they're, oh, I understand that word. Everything? Oh, yeah, I know what you mean. It's the whole place, the universe, all of it. Well, okay, so you know what history is. Now, you can tell that, that any given little local time span is going to have events that start and finish. Stuff that you kind of you complete. You finish the glass of water. Ah, big deal. Okay, it doesn't seem like it's entangled with anything. Well, that glass went someplace after that. And after that, there were the little pieces of the glass ended up in some, you know, oh, that fragment was just stuck on somebody at the bottom of somebody's shoe and ended up in Tahiti or whatever. Right? So, and all of that stuff can be in some sense, patched together start to finish, from the beginning of the universe to the end. And if you looked at that as, a, as an object, as a, as a try and have that in your model, golly, anything that you can say that really makes sense in that environment might be interesting. And so to have anything that comes together theoretically and looks like it holds water, those are big ahas. Ah, now there is an aha when you see two axes, they're mathematical constructs, they're math, we call them a basis, and we know what a basis is in English. Sure, I know what you mean. Yeah, the basis of this argument is that. We understand that these are words that have meaning in non-mathematical terms as well. And so you can have apparent ambiguities in expressing it in English that seem to wash out a little bit once you are rigorous about the definition. And to find that time is independent of the completed history was kind of a big aha. And this is a 32-year discussion with a friend of mine. Separating those two. Yeah. The completed history is independent of time. Obviously, I mean, the, that's the whole point. Is it doesn't matter when you started the, the sectioning of the little, you know, this bottle, this glass of water. It doesn't matter where you started that section. So where that glass, where the silicon atoms came from, that's all part of that back story. And all those same atoms and the energy that constitutes them, the unassigned integers. Well, where you drop your origin is, to some degree, irrelevant. Well, that's, that's my point. Right. I mean, I'm exactly. Trying to, I'm trying to... Indicated, I think I understand you. Right, right. Okay, nice, thanks. I'm very glad to be able to express that to somebody that, yeah, you know, this is not like you just jump out in the middle of this little theoretical construct. Right. So if I could do it at all, that was a miracle. <laughs>
just get, even have a, a summary of what the subject matter is, let alone the methods. Thank you for being here, Gordon. I've been speaking with Gordon Rogers, an electronic and optical mathematician, inventor, and hydrologist. If you would like to contact Gordon or to listen again to this show or to any other show, go to itssointeresting.com. It's so interesting. It's so interesting. It's so, it's so interesting. interesting. It's interesting.